a fantastic event. And we'll start off with uh, Daniel Krashen, uh, who will conclude his lecture series. All right. All right, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so today, I mean, so, so, um, so today I wanted to focus, um, for the most part, on um, like uh, cases where we can actually compute um, indices of cohomology classes and try to, you know, verify in certain cases these like uh, these conjectures or get close to them. Um, I guess before I wanted to before I do that though, I just wanted to um, kind of frame another problem, um, just kind of like um, kind of like as an advertisement or like you know call for help or something like that. Um, so I think there's like a, another kind of refinement of the period index problem that I think is very interesting um, that, um, I mean, I guess I, I don't usually talk about it because I don't even know kind of like um, what the right conjecture should be, but I still want to just put it out there just um, for people to think about because I think it's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, problem. So just the, the overall goal, right? Um, so the, the overall goal is to uh, describe how um, the behavior of um, cohomology classes, uh, in particular things like their index, et cetera, um, uh, uh, is um, constrained. By, uh, by the field, in particular, some notion maybe of the dimension of the field. Right, so this is the kind of general framework of like the period index problem where, you know, I put this conjecture out that uh, the index, for example, should divide the period. So this is for, let's say, alpha in Hn of some field with mu L tensor M coefficients or something like that, uh, the index should divide the period um, to the power of, um, of uh, what am I, uh, of uh, the dimension of the field minus one uh, choose um, N minus one. So, you know, for example, for N equals two, it should just be the dimension minus one and maybe it should do something like this. Um, but let me now uh, kind of uh, mention something that's a little bit more refined than the index. So, um, so uh, Karpenko, in, in, the, in the case of the Brouwer group, um, uh, you know, framed this kind of interesting concept called the behavior of a cohomology class. I mean, you know, so he wrote it down for the Brouwer group, but you know, one can write it down in, in general. So if you have alpha, and you know H n as I've as I have it over there. Um, let's say in the particular case where L is some prime power, uh, you can you can ask the question of not just what is um, the index of alpha, but um, when you take alpha and you multiply it in the cohomology by p, you know the index you know the class is going to get simpler and simpler, the index is going to kind of drop and drop. Um, until you go all the way down to p to the r, where, um, where the index uh, should be 1, because the cohomology class is, you know, period at worst p to the r. And you can ask, like, what do these um, indices do? So, you know, the index might start out um, p to the something, you know, the period and the index have the same prime powers. Uh, then it's p to the something else and p to the something else, et cetera. And this list of, uh, of, of kind of um, indices and higher indices, um, Karpenko calls the behavior of the cohomology class. So this is the behavior. So you might ask, you know, Besides just making a prediction about what the index is allowed to do, you might ask what is the behavior allowed to do for a given uh, dimension. And for this, I just want to mention that 
that we have some um, you know, evidence so far that there really is some constraint on the behavior based on the dimension of the field. Like it, uh, so for example, um, like if you have, so if you have like a field of, uh, of dimension three, which is kind of, uh, so this is like something like a, maybe a piatic curve or something like that. And this is a case where we can kind of do some interesting non-trivial computations, and you were to look at, for example, H2. Um, well, then um, you might ask, uh, you know, is it possible to make uh, a, you know, uh, a class, sorry, hold on, uh, sorry, <laughs> phone was ringing. Um, let's see. Like, can, you, can we make a behavior that looks like, for example, 6530 or something like that? Right. Um, sorry, one second. I, let me just. Okay. Okay. Um, so. You know, you, you can kind of do this, but, um, but not for kind of like, we don't, we don't think you can do this for fields like this. So for example, um, you know, uh, it's, so in, um, in this paper of, um, of Russell and McKinney, um, we can, you know, they, they construct stuff where you start out, for example, let's say you have period, um, so if you have, if you have period, um, p cubed, then you might have index at worst um, p to the sixth. So, and in that case, you know, if you don't go all the way to the top, if you start up at five, then you can like drop a little bit, um, do something, and and then get down to zero. You can kind of start by dropping a little bit, but if you start, but if you have period p cubed and index p to the sixth, they show it's impossible to start with this drop. You know, so like, you know, so certain kinds of behavior are, you know, if you're, if you're at the extreme case where, where you have six and, you know, and, you know, P cubed and up to six, you have to drop more quickly. Like you have to do something like six, four, you know, two, zero or something like that. So, you know, the, um, so, you know, in, in other words, you know, you have to have, if you're, if you're the most extreme kind of case of the difference between the period and the index, we expect that the, that the behavior should drop relatively quickly linearly, as opposed to, um, you know, maybe with even a faster slope, <laughs> you know, but it's not allowed to like kind of creep along and then drop down. You know, so if you wanted to graph it, we believe that, you know, doing something like you know, that should be impossible for, you know, as, as your behavior, you know, you should expect to do something like this, or you can even go faster, something like that. But exactly, you know, so what I'm, I guess, putting out there is like, somebody should like, please formulate like an expectation and, and a rationale for what's going on. It seems like, you know, there's some sort of pattern like this that's a refinement of period index, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. Okay. 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 So, anyways, that's that's the end of this first part, which is just my call for help. Um, and uh, let's now move on uh, to um, to more of the the topic. So, so now the the goal of the rest of the talk is to describe a case in which we can both. Um, so we want a context. Um, where, um, where the indexes are computable and still interesting enough to start approaching um, you know, the, the expected bounds. In, in general, it's, like, it's somehow very different. The field, difficult, the fields where we actually can compute typically, the answers are very simple and the indices aren't as crazy as they should be. So it's a, it's, we're kind of looking for this very sweet spot. 
Um, the approach of patching that I'm going to describe, um, the, the idea is we have you know, some, some kind of function field. And what we want to do is somehow exploit the, uh, the geometry of x. We're kind of imagining that we want to like, break up x in some sort of like cover, at least in some formal sense and kind of say that classes are built out of uh, classes on these various kind of like uh, open sets of some sort and glued together. Um, to do this, you can't really, you know, you can't expect that things like Zariski topology are going to be useful because we're working with a function field and every Zariski open set is the same field of functions, right? So we're going to be more inspired by thinking about an analogy with the case that x is, for example, let's say, some complex manifold, in which case we can, instead of looking at um, kind of actual open sets, we can look at, let's say, standard open sets and look at, let's say, meromorphic functions on that open set. Okay. So let me kind of put this out there. Um, so let's suppose um, that x is a um, complex manifold, um, and you consider the, the sheaf um, uh, M of meromorphic functions. I mean, the nice thing, of course, is that you know global meromorphic functions are just the uh, function field, and then you know you might uh, you might ask whether or not um, it, you know you can let's say let's say you have some algebraic structure that you're interested in. I don't know, like you're trying to say what is it like to construct a central simple algebra over C of x, and you know, if, life is, if life is fair, you might, you might say, well, if I have some open cover ui of x, and if I have some ai, which, is a, which sits over meromorphic functions of ui, and I have some agreements, bij, an isomorphism between ai restricted to ij and aj restricted to uij, that then, and plus the co-cycle condition, et cetera, then we should glue and get some, you know, maybe um, as of my al central simple algebra over the, over the meromorphic functions, right? So this would be a nice way of like constructing and working with, um, with algebras over a function field using this kind of um, standard cover, right? Okay, so, um, so just a quick poll. Do you think that actually works? Is it true that like working with algebras over a function field of a of like a you know complex manifold algebraic you know variety should be the same as working with um, you know algebras on kind of locally over meromorphic things with isomorphisms on the overlaps? Oh, isn't that careful though? In I mean, isomorphisms of. Okay, well, look, look, look. I mean, so the meromorphic, the, the sheaf of meromorphic functions is a sheaf, right? Yeah. Right? I mean,. Oh, but I mean, but it doesn't matter because the global meromorphic functions happen to be algebraic. Because what? I'm sorry. X is like a X is a projective complex variety, smooth whatever. It's we we're we're fully in the Gaga zone. That's got to work, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, okay. So I, I feel like you're a little, you're, you're, you seem a little squeamish about this, but you feel like it's, it's, possible. it's possible, yeah. What do you guys think, though? I mean, do you trust Mark? 
<laughs> so does this, does this work? Like, let's say I'm like just trying to construct like a vector space, you know, over C of X. Is that like, if I have like patching data, so to speak, gluing data for like a vector space over the, is that the same thing as a global vector space or a vector space? Or, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's, that's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, like, we're, we're gluing things together that have maybe some, like, poles or something like that. But, like, but, you know, how, but, but, they're, but they're meromorphic, right? So they're, they, they're not like, you know, you're not, like, sitting with some weird essential singularity in the middle of you, right? You're, like, you've, you've, you've got some control, right? Okay, okay, okay. I just want everybody to take a stand here. I'm just curious. Like, I mean... Can you glue these? Can you do this? Okay, let me let me ask another let me ask another related question. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you you know if you guys know the 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 yoga of like gluing and H1 and all of that, you would expect that if I did H1 um, of x in the sheaf of meromorphic function invertible meromorphic functions, what would that actually be? They should be like like line bundles over global meromorphic functions, uh, of which there's only one because it's a vector. It'd just be a one-dimensional vector space. So this should be uh, zero, right? X is a um, X is a smooth projective complex variety. <laughs> okay, so it turns out that this is true for Riemann surfaces, but it's not true in higher dimensions. Okay, so, so in this standard topology, right? Okay, so <laughs> this is like. So this is like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in fact, in fact, well, no, this isn't a constant sheaf, right? It's meromorphic function, so it really does vary as you vary your open set, but they're not they're not holomorphic. They're just meromorphic. So this is like this is. For Riemann surfaces, this is true, but it turns out very interestingly, and this was like, this. So I, I, I believed, you know, when I was younger, that, that this was just going to be zero. But it turned out there was this paper uh, in, uh, in 2010, um, let me just, I wrote down, of um, uh, Chen Kerr and uh, Karen Lewis, just this little three-page paper where they just <laughs> computed this and showed that essentially it's never zero if, if the dimension of x is at least two. So this is kind of funny. You, so it, it turns out that this logic of gluing algebraic objects together works perfectly fine in dimension one, and then it fails in higher dimension. Uh, really, I mean, morally, I think the, the reason is that, like, you know, um, the zeros and poles, when you, when you overlap things, you know, have potential, like, um, you know, the, the, the way that like kind of zeros and poles can happen can happen along kind of weird analytic subvarieties, but if you are just in dimension one, it's just a bunch of points, and that makes the kind of gluing stuff work a lot better. That's, that's my way of thinking about it, at least. Okay. So, um, so, you can't, you, so Gaga doesn't, doesn't work out for you, yeah. I mean, in some sense, you know, you can, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're only going bad at points, you can kind of, um, kind of do global tweaking, basically, by some global thing that has the right kinds of zeros and poles to make everything kind of global and then use normal Gaga. At least that's, you know, that's one way to kind of, see the way that things work in dimension one. 
But that doesn't work in higher dimensions. Yeah. OK. OK, anyway, so, um, so let, me, let me now uh, explain the idea of patching. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to do something like meromorphic functions, except um, in the case where we have uh, a field that looks like, um, let's say, k of x. Here k is a complete discretely valued field. Um, x over k is a curve. And the idea here is we want to choose um, some sort of nice model of x over the uh, ring of integers and um, guided by um, you know, the kind of formal geometry thinking, um, we want to, um, to use the topological space um, underlying uh, the closed fiber. So let's say, um, I wonder if it's, maybe I'll make it like, like little script k is going to be the residue field. So it's a little bit distinguishable. Um, so we're going to use the topological space underlying the closed fiber as kind of um, the uh, kind of analog of the kind of underlying topological space X. And what we find is that um, even though one is using the Zariski topology on this thing, when you're looking at um, you know the the formal scheme, because you know the you know, the, uh, the formal functions on the, on the open sets, you know, so if I have like, let's say U is some open set, uh, Zariski open set, let's say affine, for example, um, if we look at the, um, the formal functions, the functions on the formal scheme on U, so this is, you know, kind of concretely, this is where you look at, um, I don't know, you could, we could call it uh, like a little bit informally, like the this is like the uh, the functions which are regular on so functions on on the whole model which are regular at every point of U, right? So let me just draw a picture so that it's not too confusing. So like you know you have U in the in the just is actually just sitting in the closed fiber. It's not like a global open set. But we look at functions that are regular at every point over here. So, you know, so they can't you know, have poles along something that passes through that, for example. And then, you, uh, and then this thing, uh, if I, let's say, if I have uniformizer, um, let's say t, um, if you take the uh, t-adic completion of that, this is what we might call the, um, I don't know, R u hat. These are like the formal functions on u. So these things, you know, really do, uh, you know, change in an interesting way, like, like holomorphic functions. And if we take the fraction field of that, so this is going to be kind of our substitute uh, meromorphic functions on u. OK? Now, um, now it's, so one could play this game just using the Zariski topology on the closed fiber, but it turns out that you can do a little bit better. Um, kind of like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we, you know, one, one knows like that in the, um, like that, uh, you know, this is kind of using the Beauville Laszlo kind of thinking or Ferran Reynaud kind of thinking that if you have like uh, some variety, like some curve, for example, and you uh, look at uh, functions, let's say this is some, let's say this is R is uh, functions on, well, how about, we just, we're doing an example, how about that? So this is a nice functions on a line. Um, then if you want to have some sort of a gluing situation like this that works so now over, over these rings, then you know that, for example, defining a module over the ring is really the same as defining a module over, 
let's say, the complement of, of a point um, together with um, defining a module on a formal neighborhood of the point that you removed um, such that they kind of agree or you have gluing data over the kind of formal overlap of these two things. So this is, um, this is some sort of like a categorical fiber product is what I'm alluding to. Like to define a module over here is like defining a module over these guys together with agreement on this. And so what this, what this uh, leads us to, to, to believe is that, um, is that we shouldn't have to restrict ourselves just to Zariski open sets, but as long as we're kind of looking at kind of formal neighborhoods of some sort, we should also be able to look at individual points and have like points and complements should kind of glue together to give global things. And in fact, that's what happens, not just um, in this kind of formal context, um, but uh, meromorphically as well. So um, let me just uh, give an example kind of statement of this um, in, the, in the more kind of ring context and then kind of explain, just kind of state that it actually works in, in general. So let's say we're doing something kind of like this, except now we are over a complete field. So just kind of by way of example, let's just suppose that little k is like, um, is k of t, for example. So t was my uniformizer, which is good. And, um, and like as some sort of an analog of this statement, maybe we're looking at, um, so, uh, so what I want to do is I want to think about um, something like, um, let's say, an affine line. Um, over over k of t. Okay, so okay, so uh, so an analog of 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 this kind of statement would be to say something like, um, you know, if you if you look, well, this is, this should kind of be like maybe well, okay. This is what, I, what I'm saying right here is actually not going to work as I'm saying it, but then I'll correct it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so you might say, look at, um, you know, remove the origin and look at a kind of formal neighborhood around that. Or, you know, a, a kind of complete meromorphic or complete holomorphic things around that. Or zoom in near the origin and look at um, you know, your functions around that, or do this and look at, um, and look at uh, oh, sorry, x. And this is kind of like the overlap. And maybe these things should glue to give something like this. OK, this, these don't actually glue to give this. Um, but uh, let's say. But if you do think, actually, if you work projectively, then um, then you can make something like this work. So let me let me see what I what should I do? Yeah. So like, you know, the so if you erase the t's, then you know what we've done here is we've done this and we've inverted x. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just forgot the, yeah, OK. OK. Um, so uh, yeah, so actually, I guess these things will glue together, in fact, uh, to give you, you see, you have a similar situation where these guys glue together to give you this thing. That, that turns out to be true. Um, but you can also kind of like uh, globalize this kind of construction um, and kind of combine it with, um, uh, you know, kind of a more Gaga-like statement 
to say, what if you're actually looking at a projective variety, like a, like a curve over this uh, k of t? So in that case, um, you, know, you can do a gluing like this. I guess the pieces would be, you, for example, have, uh, uh, so I'm just going to get probably a little bit confused here, but OK. So let's say we look at the affine line away from 0, and then we look in a neighborhood of 0, and then we look at the overlap. Right. So these guys are actually going to glue together to give you to give you that. So in the sense of like how I said here, or in the sense of like the statement about modules. So this statement, which is kind of like an analog of like a Ferran Reynaud type statement, doesn't actually follow from Ferran Reynaud uh, or uh, Beauville Laszlo. Um, but this was this statement, for example, was proved by uh, Rachel Priest. Okay. So, um, okay. So what? Uh, sorry, is this totally confusing, or am I? I feel like I'm speaking non-linearly. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, I probably shouldn't have erased all the basic objects. OK. Too late. All right, so, um, so kind of an example of patching is, for example, there is an equivalence of categories. So this is, uh, let me just kind of state, uh, yeah, is there is equivalence of categories between um, Modules over, for example, the uh, fraction field of, uh, let's say, uh, k of x inverse of t. So these are kind of like meromorphic functions on the complement of the origin. Um, modules over the fraction field of, uh, K of x t. So these are like functions, kind of formal functions right around the origin. Um, oh, wait, sorry. I should have, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And then um, uh, I'm having a typographical issue because this was all supposed to be in one big line. Um, so it's like this cross subscript modules um, over the kind of overlap, which is the fraction field of, so here I have, um, let's see, I guess, yeah, fraction field of that thing, of T, that's just iterated Laurent series. So the equivalence of categories between these guys and um, modules over um, uh, k of x, uh, whoops, k of t of x. So these are like uh, rational functions on, on the line over Right, function field of P1, K of T. So this is, um, so this is an example of what we call uh, field patching. Um, So, but so first off, I just hope that the intuition makes sense here. So, what we're what we're basically trying to say is like, you know, here's like a thickened kind of like P1 over 
here's um, you know O k, uh, O O capital K, some discrete value, a complete discretely valued, uh, complete DVR. Um, this is a P1 over that. Uh, OK here is just um, little k of t. And we're grabbing like uh, the origin, and we're saying that, um, that if you want to glue together objects over the function field of this, then what you can do is look at kind of meromorphic formal functions in a neighborhood of the origin. That's this thing here. You can look at kind of meromorphic formal functions in the uh, complement of the origin. That's this thing here. It's an A1 complement over the origin. Um, with kind of um, an isomorphism given over this, which is some sort of like punctured um, open disk, a formal punctured open disk thing. Meromorphic functions on that, that there, um, which is this guy. OK? OK, so, um, so now one can, um, so okay, one, one can generalize this, um, you know, to, uh, to the situation of more uh, general curves um, and more general, like, decompositions of, like, open sets and, and all of that. So, you know, more generally, if we have, um, you know, some model of a curve over our valuation ring, and if uh, inside of here we have um, some, let's say, collection of points, I don't know, you know, P, P1 to a bunch of P's, uh, PS, I don't know, a bunch of P's, closed points on the closed fiber, and we have a bunch of U's, um, which are the complements, uh, the components of the complements. Um, it's, it's good to, uh, things work out nicely if you uh, make the U's, um, let's say the U's are all um, affine, you know, smooth, for example. So that is to say, your closed fiber might be, you know, some bunch of curves. Um, when we have singularities, we're going to choose these guys to be some of our p's, um, and you might have some more p's if you want. And then we have the complements of those. The um, so you know, basically one for each component. Then if you if you uh, have a bunch of p's and u's that kind of decompose your closed fiber, you get a very similar situation where you know, you can define these FPs to be, which are the analogs of the guys on the bottom, to be the fraction field of, on the model, the complete local ring at P. That's kind of one way to say what I've done over there. Where the FUs are the um, completions. Um, so you look at kind of functions on x that are regular at u, and you take uh, kind of t out of completion, where t is the uniformizer of your evaluation, and then you take fractions of that. And then, you know, you can do a similar kind of an overlap. So, um, so given a u that's bumping into one of these fps, what do you do? Basically, you're going to take this um, this O, X, P hat, you're going to, um, you're going to invert some stuff uh, having to do with what's invertible on, on your neighboring U, and then you're going to complete that again. So there's going to be like, you could think of it as like you're kind of localizing with respect to some uh, height one prime that describes how that component comes in, and then you take another completion. Uh, after you've done that. So this is a, a, just a way of formally trying to define these, these kinds of objects. But the point is that, um, you know, in general, um, you know, you can, you can make these same kinds of objects. So, you know, we, so for points we have our fields, for the U's we have our fields, and then really it's uh, for, uh, 
for this script P is supposed to be the like different branches of the components as they as they come in to P. There's a you know a, a slight funny business here because you might have you know a situation like this where a component kind of comes into a point more than once, in which case um, you know there's not just like it's not just course you know U kind of breaks up as a bunch of different primes and you have one for each prime at, at P in the you know in this in this local ring you know, the, your, the prime defining you might break up and you have different ones for each guy. Okay, but anyways, that's the uh, general picture. So, um, so this idea um, started out as being developed by um, uh, David Harbader and Julia Hartman, um, who were who did this really in the case where you have Zariski covers in the, in the middle, when you enhance it with the U's and the P's. Um, that's stuff that we did uh, together in like 2008, nine. Um, but what you, what you find is that um, you can really like uh, compute um, cohomology, you can, uh, you can glue together all sorts of algebraic objects um, using using these things. Let me kind of give as an example of the, of the kind of things that you can show um, of an application. You get a, um, a Meyer via torus type sequence. It's just, I'm just picking a random example. Uh, I guess I should, I should also point out, like, um, like why, does this, why is this helpful at all? Maybe it's worth saying that. Like, okay, because we started out with, with like this field, and like what could be, this is like, this looks pretty harmless, right? And these things, like I can't even, I don't even have words for these fields. I have to say like fraction of like of whatever, like this thing. This, this field doesn't have like a name. There's not like, you, you know, it's just the fraction field of this crazy thing. You know? Like why, why is that any, it seems like I went from like something that looked reasonable to something that looks that I can barely describe, <laughs> you know. So why does this help you? The thing that is much the the, the thing that's kind of uh, between the lines here is this field, even though it seems like it shouldn't hurt you, is actually very difficult. And the reason is that like even though there's this complete guy in here, this field is not complete. It's kind of it's just a curve over something complete. And so kind of leveraging under this, this kind of uh, structure of this valuation and complete structure doesn't really, is very difficult. On the other hand, these are fraction fields of rings, each of which is t adically complete. And in fact, this thing is kind of, you know, even, even more complete or whatever, right? So, um, so understanding like arithmetic of these guys is a matter of like, you know, tr first trying to like clear your denominators in some sense, and then working with things over a complete field where you can use Hensel's lemma, where you can do, you know, all sorts of standard tricks. So, so the utility is that we've reduced, um, uh, it, here's one way to think of this, is we've reduced our problem of, over this field to, well, these three fields which in essence Really, I mean, when you're because of Hensel's lemma, you can kind of, in principle, like erase these things. Like in in most computations, you can reduce things to, you know, the the kind of underlying rings here. So you've reduced it to kind of rings that are kind of one dimension smaller. And the data of how they stick together. So I mean, the way I think of it is like you know, if you think about the way in which these things fit together. The, these different components, that's fundamentally a graph. It's like maybe a, if you have like a nice normal crossings thing, it's like the dual graph of your, of your curve, right? Your stable curve, for example. And so really what you've done is you've substituted one kind of like algebraic dimension, the T, by a kind of combinatorial topological dimension, which is your, the graph. And that actually, I think, is... is uh, is kind of accurate in practice for how the calculations go. So let me give you uh, an example of this. So formally, the other thing that's really great about this is that even though we have like um, a lot of different components and points and all of that, we have a lot of like kind of patches, 
there are no um, triple overlaps. So U's only bump into the P's, and the P's only bump into the U's. And so, you know, because we're making the kind of like a decomposition. And so what that means is that, um, you know, formally it behaves as if you have kind of like two open sets, like the union of the U's and the union of the P's. And so you get kind of a meyer viator sequence as if you only have like kind of two components. So for example, it looks something like this. You get like um, H in of like your global field, the, or the whole thing, with, I don't know, mu L or whatever. I'll be a little agnostic. Mu something coefficients goes to uh, the, the, um, the pr let's say, kind of, let's call it the product over the P's of the H N F P's mu cross the product over the U's of the H N F U's um, mu. That goes to the product over all these kind of height one primes describing these kind of overlaps of the H N of the of those fraction fields. And then there's a boundary map uh, going to H N plus one of F mu, et cetera. So you actually get a long exact sequence like this, um, which is kind of telling you that this kind of cover is good for computing atoll cohomology, for example. OK. Um, and in fact, in the case where you have um, n minus 1s to the tensor n minus 1s, the boundary map um, here is actually 0. And you get, uh, well, sorry, the boundary map here is 0, I mean. Um, and so you actually get a local global principle which says understanding a cohomology class here is determined by what it looks like on all the patches. Okay. Um, so, so for example, that includes the Brouwer group, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, Yeah, and just kind of for entertainment, I mean, you know, there's a, you know, you can make a similar calculation of the fundamental group of one of these fields, and you find basically it's a combination of the fundamental groups of the various patches and then the actual uh, fundamental group of the graph of, of, the, of how these components fit together in, in, some, in some sense. Okay, so... Um, Okay. I have 12 minutes to, to do everything else that I wanted to do. <laughs> this, now this is it. This is, I, I'm, okay. Um, So, um, I don't know, am I like allergic to actually computing examples or something? Maybe that's what's going on. Like, I'm, like I've like, I've somehow delayed actually computing something and, okay. So, okay, so, so let me, um, so let me uh, kind of state uh, the, the idea of this, of this computation that I, that I want to ex explain. So, um, let me think about how to say this. So, um, okay, so I, I, what I wanted to do is just tell you about like a very recent computation of, of myself with, um, with Harbader and Hartman, um, where we um, compute um, these kind of SSDs, these stable splitting dimensions, um, in in certain cases, in particular, um, you know, three is what's kind of I'm going to be most interested in, in describing um, for a semi-global field. And um, let me just uh, kind of. So um, the. The, the approach uh, is really due in a large part to my, uh, 
former student, um, Saurabh Ghassavi, who made this kind of basic observation that often when we talk about um, splitting cohomology classes and kind of develop methods for doing it, we often do more than we say we're doing, which is not only do we figure out a way to split a given class, but usually the methods can split any finite collection of classes as well, like simultaneously with the same degree splitting field. So, um, so from that point of view, one can now add another index and say the generalized stable splitting dimension, where generalized means any finite collection instead of splitting just one. And the, the interesting thing is that, yeah, often the bounds for the GSSDs and the SSDs turn out to be like we have the same information. Um, so let me, um, let me, uh, let me now give an example of, um, let's see. Um, I didn't write the correct statement in my notes. That that's okay. So um, okay. So. So the, in other words, like I, because I didn't write the correct statement, I'm going to give, I'm not sure if the numbers that I'm going to come up with are going to be the exact right ones. But the, but the paper's published. So I mean, you can, like, you can check the actual numbers. But OK, so, the, the, um, so rough, roughly speaking, the, the idea is if you're given, um, right, so, so we, we come up with a way of, um, of computing the, the GSSD. Uh, so here we have, like, let's say, f is something like um, k of x. Um, residue of k is, is little k. And so if you, are, if you know about the, the, right, so we can bound the GSS in d of f by um, if we in terms of, so this is equal to the GSS D in of K plus the GSS D in, or sorry, bounded by of, of K of X plus either two or three, depending on if L is even or odd. So just like before, like, you know, somehow like splitting two classes, like the methods of Perutka are kind of awkward and aren't kind of as good for splitting um, uh, mod two classes. Okay, so the so, so roughly speaking, the um, the idea here, well, I mean, you know, what what's the idea here? So you you have some cohomology class that's defined on the function field of one of these kinds of models. You, uh, you use perutkification to, um, to make it kind of uh, unramified and therefore sitting on the uh, closed fiber, basically. And now you look on all of these little local patches, all these RUs, and, and Gobber's kind of like uh, affine base change stuff tells you, which is kind of like, you know, souped up Hensel's lemma, basically, tells you how to, like, reduce things to just looking at cohomology classes on the closed fiber. And then you need to kind of describe how to split everything locally and glue all of those things together. Um, if you had a single cohomology class, it would have been enough to just kind of, like, split a single thing locally, but kind of splitting collections, you have to be a little more careful. 
Um, and anyway, so you get like this, these, these factors are about kind of locally splitting things around the point or on the U's, at the points and on the U's via Hensel's lemma. And then the other is from kind of the purification stuff. So what you find is that if you can, if you're in a situation where you understand how to split kind of classes over residue fields and function fields of residue fields, then you got some interesting stuff. So the interesting thing is that we're, we as, so what's the kind of input for this? One interesting input is the case where k is, um, let's say, um, a, am I going to get this right? Uh, yeah, a curve over a finite field. Maybe I'll use y because I had the variable x over there. In this case, um, the kind of uh, next up thing when you look at k of x is now a, cur a, a surface over a finite field. Um, and, um, and so what we are actually able to show, the kind of interesting input for this, is that if you have any finite collection, this is kind of independently, I think, kind of interesting, is that if you have any finite collection of cohomology classes, over in H3 of a surface over a finite field, what we show is that you can split all of them, like let's say they're you know, mu L uh, torsion, L torsion, then you can split all of them with a single extension of degree L simultaneously. So this is, I think, this is really the interesting non-trivial input. And then once you have this, um, and in my, in my last one minute, by the way, I'm going I'm to say two minutes about something else. In the last one minute, I'll explain this. But, um, but once you have that, then you can start kind of iterating this process and say, well, if you understand about this, now you can also look at you know, something like this and kind of say iterated things about how H3 behaves, when you, when you look at these fields, the kind of semi-global fields that you build out of these, they are, um, the interesting thing is that the bound that you get for, um, for period index for the H3 is exactly the conjectural bound in that case. Okay, so what does that mean though? I mean, it means less than like, it feels like it should. It doesn't mean that we know that that bound is correct. It's just that we know that that is an upper bound in this case, but we don't know that it's achieved, for example. Like actually writing down cohomology classes that are that complicated, we don't know how to do, which is really unfortunate. But you know, at least that upper bound kind of comes out of this method, which is interesting. OK, and now in the last, oh, I have two minutes instead of one. Um, I want to just say, like, kind of how you split these H3 classes. So for, for people who think about this, I think this is kind of neat, because it's a little bit different than usual. I'll draw a picture. So here's the surface. And your H3 class um, it, you know, has some ramification. It's ramified along some curves in my, in my surface. Um, and the ramification of this H3 class is described by Brouwer classes on these curves. Now, the Brouwer, a Brouwer class on a curve is all over a finite field, these are global fields, are also described by their ramification. So on each of these curves, there's like little bits of ramification of the various Brouwer classes on these curves. Now, I'm, I know you take the union of all the ramification of all the H3 classes and pretend this is the picture. So how do you um, split uh, this extension? Well, the, the, this cohomology class, the idea is that you make a cover of the surface and you focus on just these points. And all you do is you split the ramification of the Brouwer classes. You split the ramification of the ramification. Well, when you do that, these Brouwer classes become unramified and therefore trivial, which means that the H3 classes are therefore unramified. And then a result of Kato says there is no unramified H3. So when you do that, you kind of take a, you just take a ramification curve and cut through those points and kind of bridge it and ramify around that. You know, it's, so 
it's, it's, it's somewhat delicate, actually. In fact, like, so, um, okay, so that was the first method that we kind of tried. But the problem when you, when you do these things, like whenever you try to split ramification, it's like, it's like kind of making the carpet straight. You know, whenever you like flatten it down over here, it bulges over there. You know, so like, the problem is like when you make your cover and you split the ramification that you were looking at, then what you find is that your cover then has weird singularities. And then when you resolve them, you realize, oh, now there's more ramification that I missed. <laughs> right? So in fact, what we do is we make our cover um, atoll at these points, instead of branched at those points. And well, then the point is like, it's just actually an extension of some finite field. And so we know what that is, no matter how, you know, so that's what, means, that's what makes it nice, so that like, if you have different ramification of different Brouwer classes, well, it's always just an extension of a finite field at the end of the day, and you just, you know, there's no choice. Yes. Exactly. So the ramification of the Brouwer class is actually an H1, which is an extension of a finite field, and we just match those finite fields with an unramified thing. I mean, there, there is, there's a lot of delicacy to it still beyond that, because like, I mean, because these curves are actually like singular, for example, and like, and it's not exactly as I said, but like, but that's the idea. I'm done. Thank <laughs> you.